Well, a very good morning to you. Uh, I have had um, a wonderful honour of being able to preach in uh, many different chapels over Suffolk, even go across the world and go in, um, and speak in Indonesia. But never did I think I would get to have the honour of preaching in my own front room. And so uh, you're very welcome here amongst, amongst us. We are joined by some cows as well. So they are to be felt very welcome with us. Um, it's all sort of very strange, isn't it? Um, the word unprecedented has been used quite a lot lately. It's very strange times. And um, I was listening to a friend uh, just recently uh, speaking about Psalm 46. And there's the verse in there that we love uh, using and, and quoting where it says, Be still and know that I am God. And uh, very often we use it in the context of just sort of slowing down, stopping for a moment and listening to God's voice. And it can definitely be used in that way. But in the context, it's being spoken to the nations, the the raging nations who, who hate God and are, are at war with one another. And God just comes amongst them and just says, be still. I am God. I am in control. And we can see that being played out even today, can't we? The nations have been raging um, for years and years and years. And just all of a sudden, in the matter of weeks, because of a microscopic little thing, all these nations are just put on pause. They are still. You can go out for your one, one, one walk a day and you can just feel how just still and quiet it is. It just shows, doesn't it, who's in control. The nations are not in control. The government isn't in control. Everyone's losing their minds because they're not in control. But God is. Be still and know that I am God. And I think we should be using this time where we are stuck at home and uh, not able to do very much to do that, to remember that God is in control. I know this time as well, um, please do just make contact with us if you do need anything, supplies, support, you know, uh, someone to talk to, just get on the phone to um, one of the deacons uh, or somebody else in the church and we'd love to really just help out. That's what we're here for. Uh, but in the meantime, here we are this morning, gathered together in a sort in a way around God's word. And so I'm going to be bringing God's word to you. If you don't know who I am, I am Scott Pipe Wolverston. I am the church intern and um, I'm going to be leading us through a, a, a short service here today. Um, I think Tim and Simon last week, they, they read through the hymns during the service. I didn't want to do that. I just thought I would get a bit tired of my own voice. So I'm not going to read through the hymns, but what I have done is I have uh, put together a playlist on YouTube uh, with the Stone Market Baptist Church account uh, of some, some hymns, some songs, and um, hopefully Stephen Payne, our technician, is going to uh, put that somewhere on the screen. Maybe it will appear here or over here, somewhere I don't know. Um, it may be down in the description below the video. And just click on that link at the end of the service and I'll take you to around four videos um, with, with words on the screen of um, just some songs that I picked out for this service. So you can actually listen to some music and um, maybe even sing along as well. So. Uh, I'll, I'll point you towards that again at the end of the service. But we're going to start with God's Word. So please have a Bible with you. Please open it up. We're going to be reading from uh, John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Uh, you may know if you have been with us um, over the past few months that I've been going through a series in the book of John on the, God, on, on the, the I Ams. The I Ams of, of Jesus we saw Jesus as the bread of life. He said that I am the bread of life. And we saw how we can satisfy our every need. And that uh, he invites us to the banquet table. He feeds us through his death and resurrection. We, we looked at how Jesus is the light of the world. How he is that witness that declares who God is to us. And he invites us into uh, this sort of um, communion of the Trinity. And... Uh, one verse we've been looking at quite a lot is John 17, 3, that says, This is eternal life, knowing God, knowing Christ whom he has sent. And that's the kind of the point of this series, is to be knowing more of our God. Everlasting life starts now. It isn't just for later. Everlasting life starts now in knowing our God. And uh, no quarantine can prevent us from doing that. Knowing who he is, 
what he has done and, and what he says he is. And so we're going to be looking at our third uh, episode in this, in this series, in John chapter 10. So please do have your Bible open at John chapter 10. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 39. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and his sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will be by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the father knows me, even so I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, He has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Now it was the feast dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubts? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God's. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know, and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hands. Well, that is the, um, the word of God. We're going to now pray, and so please join me um, as we 
bring our requests to our Lord, our God and our Shepherd. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Lord of my shepherds, I shall not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me beside the still, still waters. He restores my soul. Lord, even though we may walk through the valley of shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for you are with us. Lord, for, a, for, a, for many people in our congregation, they perhaps feel like they are in the shadow of of death it's quite a scary and and worrisome time people are getting sick i heard just today of um of, of somebody who who, uh, who i knew who passed away from from this virus lord it's a scary time and we are perhaps walking in that valley of the shadow of death but we haven't got to be afraid for you are with us you are our good shepherd you are leading us to good and green pastures Lord, I pray for all of us at Stowmarket Baptist Church that you would help us to be trusting in you at this time, to just to be still, to know that you are God, that you are in control, that none of this has happened outside of your will, that you have brought us about for your good pleasure, for, for your glory. Lord, we don't understand how or why, but we know that you are working through all things for the good of those who love you and for your own namesake. And so we put our trust in you, Lord, within this crisis, in this situation. But nevertheless, we do pray for the various needs of, of people. Lord. We pray for, for the old, that, that um, as they are self-isolating, that they would not become lonely. Many of them are living on their own. And I pray, Lord, that your presence would be made known to them. And not just in a spiritual way, Lord, but that you would use the means of your flock, of your sheep, that um, your people would be ringing up, uh, calling up uh, the older folk and speaking to them on the phone and praying for them, that they may know that they are not alone, that you are always with them, and that, that we, as your flock, are also still together, even if we are apart. Lord, I pray for those who have had their work cut off, um, They've been unable to go to work. I pray for them in financial situations. We thank you for the government that they have supplied um, financial uh, needs for people. We do pray for those who are out of work, that you would be with them and help and uphold them at this time. We pray for the young people and the, the children who are no longer in school, uh, who have had their GCSEs cancelled. Lord, I think of uh, people like, like Micah, uh, Elijah and others, laws who have had exams cancelled. We pray for them that they would not be too discouraged. Um, and that you would be helping them at this time to understand your purposes within this. We do pray for the young people who aren't converted, Lord, that, that they may see the example of their parents as they sit at home, and that their parents may be able to share the truth of Scripture with them, and that even at this time, maybe as we come back and we finally meet together again, there will be people who are saying, uh, I, I believe that God is in control. I, I trust him for my salvation. I believe in the, the gospel, in the cross resurrection. Well, that would be a wonderful thing if I mean, we meet back together in person. There would be baptisms, Lord. We do pray for that. Pray for those, Lord, who have been guests amongst us for the past few months, uh, that they would not, um, not return to us uh, when we return, but that, but, but that they would come back amongst us. Lord, we pray for, for people like that and we pray, Lord, for your missionaries across the globe right now, that they would not be held back by this virus, um, but they would somehow be able to minister to your people and, and be of help and assistance to those who are in need. Lord, we confess our sin to you. Lord, we are such sinful people. It can't even be put into words, Lord. We often look into the Old Testament and the, the Israelites and the Jews and the failings they made and we often judge them, Lord, but we are worse often. Lord, Peter denied you three times. How many times have we denied you? Judas betrayed you for 30 pieces of silver. How much less would we do it for? And yet, Lord, you just show us more mercy, more grace that covers every stain Lord, you are so good, so kind. Lord, you are holy and just, and yet you are still also so merciful and loving. 
full of steadfast love and faithfulness. Lord, I pray that we would not waste our time over these coming weeks and months, but that we use it to our advantage. We use all the spare time we have to draw closer to you, to know more of your words. Lord, often um, reading the Bible and understanding the Bible is like, it's like growing a garden. Often you've got to do a bit of raking, you've got to read for, for breadth, but often we have to dig deep, we have to cultivate and sow. Lord, help us just to dive deep into your word over these coming months and that, that it may blossom into a, a garden full of um, a, an abundance of, of fruits and, and, um, and a harvest, Lord. Let us just cultivate our knowledge of you. Help us to do this because our own hearts just want to do everything else. Lord, so um, please just help us now and let your spirit conform us into the image of Christ each day. So, Lord, as we look into your word in a moment, please bless it to us. Give us understanding and, uh, may, us, uh, and, and, and may we just know more of you through it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. OK, so we're going to look into God's word now. So please have your Bible Still open at John chapter 10. So we've been going through a series in the I Ams and uh, we're in for a special treat today. We have two for the price of one. I am the door and I am the good shepherds. These are very, very important topics. I reckon everyone listening right now would agree that humans are like sheep. We follow the crowd. I remember recently watching a, uh, a social experiment where they uh, got a load of actors uh, to go into a doctor's waiting office and um, every minute this beep would go off and all the actors would stand up in unison together and sit back down again. And um, this, this punter came in, somebody didn't know what was going on and um, they came in, they signed in at the, at the, uh, the, the uh, reception area, they went and sat down and then this beep went off and all the actors stood up and, and the person's just like, well, what's going on? And they all sit down again. And then and a minute passes, the next beep happens, everyone stands up and the person just <laughs> joins, joins with them. Stands up too, they, they don't know why, but everyone else is doing it. So they just follow the crowd. There's perhaps no greater example of, of the sort of herd mentality of humans than the current toilet paper pandemic. Uh, one person goes out and panic buys and stockpiles loads of toilet paper. Next minute, all of us go and do it. We just follow the craze. Uh, and there are even people amongst our congregation that I know of stockpiled toilet paper, but I won't uh, name and shame who that was. Whether it be uh, panic-driven hysteria, viral internet trends, uh, you know, celebrities, uh, the ne next iPhone, memes and films. We follow the crowd, don't we? We just join in. That's a given. Humans all follow something. Uh, leaders, movements, trends. However, are we following the right thing? Are we following the right person? And that's something of what we're going to be looking at. Uh, in God's word today. So like I say, two I am to the price of one. There's a lot to get through here, so I'm going to try and, and uh, get through as fast as I can. Uh, you have the luxury of putting me on pause if you want to do. Uh, you can't do that when we're in church together, but we're going to try and get through this as fast and concisely as we can. So, the I am the door of the sheep and I am the good shepherds. And that picture of the shepherds with their sheep is I think one of my favourite illustrations in the Bible of a shepherd with their sheep, it's an encouraging and a beautiful image for us to see. It's an angle of which we can look at God and just think of how kind and gentle he is. But we can see that Jesus is the only trustworthy and sacrificial shepherd king given by the Father who protects us from our every enemy. Jesus is the good shepherds, unlike the faulty and abusive Pharisee shepherds. And that we must enter by Jesus and follow closely behind him 
and listen to his voice. So in verses 1 to 6 in John chapter 10, Jesus introduces an illustration. And in verses 7 to 18, he then expands on that illustration and looks at it from different angles, uh, namely the door and then the shepherd. So we're going to lay out the sermon like that. So we're going to look first at the illustration. That's verses 1 to 6. Then we'll look at the point Jesus makes about the door, verses 7 to 10, and then the shepherds, verses 11 to 18. And then we'll just close off with some uh, some word application. So, the sheepfold illustration, verses 1 to 6. Let's just dive into the text and make some observations. Verses 1 to 6. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So we've got here a shepherd, some sheep, a sheep fold, a, a gatekeeper, thieves, robbers. That's the picture. That's the image, the illustration. What's going on here? What's happening? Well, firstly, when it says that they did not understand what he was saying, it's not because the imagery he was using was unfamiliar to them. Actually, it's quite the opposite. It's perhaps quite unfamiliar for people amongst us, maybe, here in the West. I remember um, hearing a story of um, uh, back in World War Two when uh, kids were sent out from the cities and had to go into the countryside, that there were reports of you know children just being terrified when they saw a, a sheep or a cow because they just had no idea what it was. They hadn't seen one in person before. They just... But it was a monster or something. Not so much the same for many of us Suffolk country bumpkins. Uh, we are quite a farming community out here. But um, for some people, this illustration may not be very familiar. But this was extremely familiar and contemporary to the people that Jesus was speaking to at the time. Most households outside of the big city walls uh, would have been... Uh, self-sustaining pretty much they were an agricultural uh, community they would have had um, a sheep pen outside of their own land outside their house it's been a stone wall surrounding a portion of grounds with only one point of entry the sheep would come in at night and they'd be kept safe from predators and, and thieves and uh, a gatekeeper would, would sit at the door of this pen and would keep them safe. Now a thief who would want to nab a little sheep would have to jump over the wall. They wouldn't go through the door. But the shepherd who arrives in the morning to go and get his sheep, the gatekeeper lets him in and the shepherd calls his sheep and leads them out. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, Jesus isn't just pulling out this illustration just out of a hat. But again, there's, a, there's a, a cultural difference going on here. Here in the West, uh, when it comes to shepherding, we drive sheep. We get quad bikes, we get um, sheep dogs and we drive the sheep to a location or out of location. Not so in the east. In the east, the shepherd leads the sheep with his own voice, with his own call. You can go on YouTube later on and search just shepherds calling sheep and you can see it happen. Uh, there'll be someone who will try and call for the sheep and they do nothing. And the shepherd comes along, calls the sheep and all of them just come bounding over. I read recently a, a blog where someone saw three shepherds um, as, as a, a sheep fold and all of their sheep had, in, had sort of mi mingled together in this fold 
and the writer of the log wondered, well, how on earth are they going to work out which sheep are theirs? And so it, it turns out that the three shepherds, they, uh, they say the, their goodbyes, and, and they all part ways, and then they, they call their sheep. And you see quite quickly just sort of portions of the sheep just sort of start to merge and move together, and suddenly all the sheep have gone out in three sections following their shepherds. They, they heard his voice, they recognised the call. Now, what the sheep represent in the imagery that Jesus is, is using here? Well, we already spoke about it, didn't we? Humans, people, people like sheep. I, I think that the sheep illustration is just perfect for humanity. Throughout the Bible, we are referred to as sheep, but why? Why did God choose sheep as a picture of, of who we are? He could have chosen dogs or cats, birds, you know, the, these are the, the birds of my pasture. No, he chooses sheep. Why? Frightened, skittish, wandering, wayward, vulnerable, needy sheep. Sheep aren't especially dumb like we often make them out to be. They're actually quite intelligent as far as animals come, but if they're one thing, they are incredibly needy. Incredibly needy. So why does God use sheep as an illustration for us? Sheep can't fend for themselves. If a sheep doesn't have his wool shaved, he'll barely be able to even see its wool will get full of parasites and, and diseases. There's something that's called cast sheep, when a, a sheep will fall over onto his back and be unable to even right himself, and he'll just die there on his back, a perfectly healthy sheep, he just couldn't get up again. A ram can get its horn stuck in a thicket, and unless somebody comes and helps that ram and, and takes it out, the ram stuffed, can't do anything. Often their uncared for feet can get so infected and the hooves can get so long that they can barely even walk. Their knees get inflamed and, and the, the weak ewes don't have enough milk for their lambs and they, they die from malnutrition and exposure. They can't run fast. They haven't got claws or fangs. They have no defence against predators, you know, bears and wolves and lions, robbers and thieves. They are entirely without defence. An isolated sheep is kind of like meals on wheels for, for a wolf. Sheep are incredibly vulnerable, incapable, needy, and they cannot survive on their own. And until we understand that we are the same, that I am the same, that you are the same, that we are needy, vulnerable, we can't make it on our own without someone to help us. We're stuffed, we're stuck, we can't do anything. We're in danger. Until we understand that about ourselves, then sin still has its power over our life. Sin takes a silly, vulnerable and fragile little sheep and makes them think that they're a lion. It makes them think that they're the bee's knees, that they're the real deal, that they can make it on their own. I'm not a sheep, I'm a lion. I don't need the shepherds. I don't need God. I can conquer all my foes and have everything I'll ever need. I can make it all by myself. The world is my oyster. I'm in charge. It's my life. I can do what I want with it. And all the while, the wool is just getting thicker and thicker and thicker. And you can see less and less and less. And the wolf is getting closer and closer and closer. Isaiah 53 says that we all like sheep have gone astray. Every one to his own way. Sheep need a shepherd. People need a shepherd, a leader, a guide, a king, 
someone to keep us safe, someone to take us the right way. We need to be shepherded, but who by? Look at verse 5. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. They do not know the voice of strangers. So we need a shepherd. And who is it? Not a stranger. We do not need to be shepherded by a stranger. But there have been many strangers trying to shepherd the flock. We'll just bleed into the next section for a second. Look at verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, True, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Firstly, who is Jesus speaking to in this passage? Look at chapter 9, verse, uh, verse 40. This is the context. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things. Just remember that the chapter numbers shouldn't be there. This is still the same conversation as chapter 9. Jesus is in the presence of the Pharisees. Now, what happened in chapter 9? A blind man, a poor, little, vulnerable sheep, abused and treated harshly by the shepherd's impostors, thrown out of a synagogue by the religious leaders, the Pharisees. They are the thieves and robbers and strangers. In Matthew 27, Jesus accuses them, where they, they lay up heavy burdens for the people and don't even lift a finger to, to, to help them. They rob their old by creating pious laws that would mean that you could donate your money to the temple rather than to your aging parents. They legalistically ruled over the people with a firm hand and abused the sheep. They have not come through the door. They have not come through the right way. They've jumped over the wall. And they are abusive and false shepherds who are beating and robbing the sheep. Over in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel 34, it talks about the abusive leaders and shepherds of Israel. Let me read it to you. It's Ezekiel 34. Verses 1 to 10. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds. Thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat ones. But you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the stray not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered, because there was no shepherds, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered, they wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth, with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey, and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherds, and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep, therefore, you shepherds, hear word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand, and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths, for they may, that they may not be food for them. That's what's happening here in John chapter 10. The good shepherds, is rescuing his sheep from the impostors, from the thieves, the robbers, the false messiahs even. There have been a lot of them in Jesus' day. I think over in Acts 5 or 6 there's mention of um, some people, I think one called Theodos and Judas, um, who were basically messiahs, they were false messiahs leading the people in a, a violent revolution that just ended in 
everyone dying really. All these false shepherds were nothing but thieves and robbers who abused the flock. And there are many modern day Pharisees and abusive shepherds who do not enter the church by the gates. They rather jump over the wall and they seek to harm the church. Sow your seed of $200. Give your tithe and you'll reap a harvest, a blessing. Uh, God will heal you of your leukemia, of, of your cancer. God will bless you if you just give money to me, to my ministry. You can learn sinless perfection. Just follow these steps. Or perhaps uh, just stop watching TV. Don't do sports. Don't laugh. Do this. Don't do that. Um, wear this. Don't wear that. See those people. Don't see those people. Listen to the pastor and do what he says. Otherwise you'll be cursed by God. Those are some of the voices that maybe you have heard. It's abuse of the flock. No love. Strangers, thieves and robbers. Maybe some of you listening have experienced that for yourself. You've come out perhaps of churches that were like that. That were legalistic and harsh. Or ones that, that, that were liberal and didn't care about sin. They were abusive shepherds. But praise God that perhaps you've come out of that. You've heard that that was not his voice. That was not the voice of the shepherds. You didn't recognise it. So you fled from them. And there are many others. There's um, Joseph Smith, the founder of, of Mormonism. Charles Taze Russell, the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses. There's Muhammad, Buddha, Gandhi. Um, oneness, Pentecostalism. There's the New Apostolic Reformation, the Emergent Church. They're false shepherds, false teachers that come in sheep's clothing, trying to lead the sheep away from the true shepherds. There was Stalin, there was Hitler, the messianic heroes and leaders of history that promised the world and ended up destroying it. The Marxist dreams of a communist utopia. Leader after leader after leader that we follow, the, the next trend, the next Messiah, the next saviour, the next shepherd, they all come along and they just pull the crowd with them and we go with them. Thieves, robbers and strangers who slaughter the sheep, steal the wool and let the strays go loose. Many of them have been saying that Oh, it's God's will. But as one of Aesop's tales goes, any excuse will serve a tyrant. They're nothing but wolves in sheep's clothing. But here's the thing about wolves in sheep's clothing. They look like sheep. <laughs> a lot of the things I just gave you, um, the people I, I, I spoke about, um, the sort of caricatures I just gave, it might seem quite obvious and blatant to us that that's wrong, but wolves come in sheep's clothing. What are the wolves that are perhaps are amongst us, amongst our own thoughts? What are the things that we believe that perhaps aren't true? That What are the voices that are in our heads that are not the voice of the shepherds? What messages have we believed from society, from people around us, from our own hearts? that is not the voice of the shepherds. We have to test ourselves, don't we? Uh, uh, seek our, through our own heart. What things have I believed about Christian living, about prayer, about, about the church, about sin, that are not the things that have come from Christ, our true shepherds? Is it the voice of him or is it from another wolf? Can a Christian be deceived for a period of time can a Christian believe in, in false beliefs for how long? I don't know. I, I don't know how that was. I imagine that there are people in you know, the Catholic Church and other churches that are saved and born again. I don't know if, um, how that all works. 
I, I believe that God brings those people out from false teaching and false belief. But let me just read this quote to you from, from D.L. Moody. An Eastern shepherd once was once telling a gentleman that his sheep knew his voice and that no stranger could deceive them. The gentleman thought he would like to put the statement to the test. So he put on the shepherd's frock and turban and took his staff and went to the flock. He disguised his voice and tried to speak as much like the shepherds as he could. But he could not get a single sheep in the flock to follow him. He asked the shepherd if his sheep never followed a stranger. He was obliged to admit that if a sheep got sickly, it would follow anyone. So it is with a good many professing Christians. When they get sickly and weak in the faith, they will follow any teacher that comes along. But when the soul is in health, a man will not be carried away by errors and heresies. He will know whether the voice speaks the truth or not. He can soon tell that if he's really in communion with God, that when God sends a true messenger, his words will find a ready response in the Christian hearts. And so praise God that he does uh, lead and bring people out of false teaching and from abusive um, churches and shepherds. We have to be healthy. We have to be close with God and know God to be able to discern a voice that is not the voice of our God, right? There's only one shepherd for the sheep who can lead us to green pastures. There's only one shepherd who calls us out by name. And we hear and we cannot help but respond and follow when we hear that voice. Let's go back to that passage in Ezekiel 34 again. It's Ezekiel 34 verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he's among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all places where they've been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I'll bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and I'll bring them into their own land. And I'll feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines and in the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. They shall lie down in good grazing land and on a rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherds of my sheep and I will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. God promised hundreds of years before that he would shepherd his people and lead them to a new promised land where they would graze in safety and in peace. Here in John chapter 10, that shepherd's arrived. He's kicking out the thieves and the robbers and he's coming to collect his sheep. Now in verse 6 they uh, didn't understand what he was saying. Why? They weren't his sheep. They didn't recognise his voice. Because he was not their shepherd. The second heading now. I am is the door. Verses 7 to 10. Look at verse 7. So Jesus again said to them. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I think I remember that the very first public uh, Bible talk that I ever did, um, I think it was at FOI, at the youth group, uh, it was on this verse, I am the door. And I remember uh, giving this illustration of, of this house with um, many rooms and, um, and there was this big door as well. 
And in these rooms, there were all these distractions of life. You know, there were Xboxes and uh, skateboards and uh, roller coasters, <laughs> uh, you know, books, uh, whatever you want, whatever distraction in life you want. We were filling these rooms. And um, there's also a fire that we set off in this house from the moment we were born. And it's getting uh, stronger and stronger. And it's burning more and more and more. And the question is, do we just distract ourselves with these things in the rooms or do we go to this big door you haven't gone through it before it says fire exit over the top do we just ignore that and stay in the rooms no we go to the fire exit we get out from the fire from our own sin and the fire exit is Jesus Jesus is the door he is the only he's the sole means of salvation from death this ties into um, another I am we're going to look at in a few weeks time on where um, Jesus says that he is the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through him. In that sheepfold that we looked at earlier, there was only one way in and out through the door. Verse nine, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The world will tell you right now that all roads lead to, lead to heaven. You can believe that, you can believe this, you can follow that guy or this guy, or whatever you want. We're all fine, just as long as you're a good person, you'll go to heaven. That's not true. That's not true. There's only one gate one door one way into the kingdom if you try another way guess what you've turned up to the wedding without a suit on and without an invite you're a thief you're a robber you're gonna get kicked out you don't belong there you have to come through the door you have to come through jesus those false messiahs had proclaimed a way of salvation that was not the appointed way they were not the appointed Messiah. They did not fit the bill and the bill of goods they were giving wasn't the right bill of goods. Jesus' authenticity as the Messiah, the true shepherd, is confirmed by his ministry, his signs, his witness. If you remember a few weeks ago, we spoke about um, the witnesses of Jesus, the prophets, the Old Testament, Moses, John the Baptist. They have witnessed and testified as to who Jesus was, that he was the real deal. They were the lock. Jesus is the key. They were the shadow. He is the, the, the body. There are well over three to four hundred prophecies in the Old Testament about the Messiah, about the Christ. Do you have any guesses about the mathematical probability of one person filling just eight of those prophecies, just eight of them, one chance in 10 to the 17th power. That's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, 17 times, one in that number, <laughs> right? You try and work that out later on, but the point is, Jesus fulfills all of them. That's the chance if one guy fulfilled eight, Jesus fulfills all of them. He is the right guy. He fits the bill. The gatekeeper can let him in. He is the only door and the only way of salvation. No other way. Nobody else. Now look at um, verse 10, just the second half of it. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. What is abundant life? Well, Abundant means, you know, there's loads of it, it's, it's full, it's just extravagant, loads of life, life to the fullest extent. We could perhaps put it as eternal life. And what is eternal life? John 17, 3, we've said it again and again and again. This eternal life, knowing God, knowing Jesus, whom he sent. That's the abundant life. That's eternal life. Jesus is not just the way in. He's the destination. We go through the door and Jesus is the door. But Jesus is also the, 
the pasture, I guess you could say. Jesus is his destination. That's the point of coming in. And, and, and um, this is the point of discipleship for, for Christians. Let me just give you another quote. Shepherding in Israel is a wonderful metaphor uh, of this kind of discipleship. In many countries, sheep spend their lives in fenced-in pastures, where they spend most of their time grazing and milling about. Many Christians seem to think that the Great Commission is a matter of getting sheep into the pen, inviting people to accept Christ, the high point of the spiritual lives. In other words, going through the door, being saved, justified, great. But in Israel, however, where grass has difficulty growing in the arid soil, sheep must know their shepherds, following him obediently from pasture to pasture. There, shepherding is a much more active task. So, in other words, we're not just saved for the safety of, of the flock, of the church, as it were. We aren't just saved for a free ticket to heaven, but we're saved to follow and know our shepherds. Friends, do you think that you just accepted Jesus, asked for forgiveness, and you got your flu shot, <laughs> and that's it? Nothing more to do. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go to church once a week. Maybe I'll uh, occasionally pick up my Bible and, and pray. But the extent of my religious life ends there. Nothing else goes on. Or are we to grow? Grow in our knowledge of the shepherds. Is that happening? Do you know Jesus more now than you did five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago? Do you know more of his love, more of his patience, more of his faithfulness, more of his wisdom? Do you recognise his voice more? Imagine two people got married and after the wedding they saw each other once a week, spoke for an hour, sent the odd text here and there. And, and you ask them, do you know your spouse more than you did 10, 15, 20 years ago? Pfft, nah, no. That'd be a tragedy, wouldn't it? That would be an absolute tragedy. Imagine a, a, an apprentice bricklayer comes to a, a, a man who's been laying bricks for 20, 30, 40 years. And he says to him, sir, can you show me how to lay bricks? And the bricklayer turns to him and says, laying bricks? No, nah, I can't do that. No, I can't show how to do that. Go ask somebody else. That'd be shameful, wouldn't it? That'd be terrible. And yet it seems that in the church, we accept that. A young Christian, been converted only perhaps a year, a few months, a few years maybe, comes to an older Christian. You've been a Christian for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And comes to them and says, Sir, madam, can you show me how to follow the shepherds? How to recognise and hear his voice? Nah, I can't do that. Ask the pastor, he'll do it for you. Shameful. We should not be doing that. It's entirely unacceptable. We just get the pastors just to do it for us. But no, we have to be experts on the shepherds. We have to know him and then let others know him as well. We aren't just saved just to come into the sheepfold, but we're saved to know our shepherds more and more and more. The Christian life is more than just the wedding, more than just the conversion. It's about knowing God knowing and savouring his voice. Finally, we come to the good shepherd. Look at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. 
I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. The good shepherd. The, the blind man of chapter 9. The, the little blind and lost sheep. Jesus seeks him out, finds him lost and alone in the field. And the good shepherd, shepherd opens his eyes so that he sees the light of the world. The Pharisees, the false shepherds, the thieves and robbers, Jesus is the stark contrast of them. They chucked the blind man out of the synagogue, out of the fold. Jesus, the good, kind, gentle shepherd, he helps and restores the sheep. He doesn't abuse us. He doesn't rattle us upside down to get out everything he can from us, all our money or whatever. He, he cares for us. Needy and helpless sheep. I, I love here how, how Jesus points out that he's not a hired hand, that Jesus isn't just doing his duty for a wage. He's not just in it for the money. He's like, yeah, all right, Father, I'll, I'll go and save the sheep as long as you pay me. That's not what's going on. Jesus is not a hired hand. Over in Matthew 9, uh, Jesus is looking out over the crowd and they are, they're, they're bemused, they're scared, they're harassed. And it says that Jesus looked out over them like sheep without a shepherd and that he has compassion on them. Jesus is the one who leaves the 99 to find the one. He goes out searching on the mountains and climbing hills to seek out that one wandering sheep. And he rejoices and throws a party when he finds that one sheep. Jesus is not a hired hand that's just going to leave you at the drop of a pin. Jesus is not an unempathetic and disingenuous lackey who's just going to just run away at the slightest bit of trouble. No. Jesus foresaw your every sin, your every trouble, all the mess that, that would unwind out of your life. He still sought you out, little sheep. He knows us and we know him. And he even became like us, didn't he? The shepherd became a lamb. He became a human being, just like us. Look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. So we as Christians are as known and as loved by Jesus as Jesus is by the Father. Isn't that incredible? That's amazing. These are really just fantastic things. The good shepherd protects us from all of the wolves and bears of life. His word, his voice, it, it teaches us against the false voice of the shepherds, of, of the false shepherds and the thieves and robbers. His word protects us from false teaching. Not only that, but he said that he lays down his life. I remember reading a story um, uh, and, and the, it, it was making a point about prayer, but it works in some ways for this as well, where um, a man is sitting out in his porch and he's looking out over on the horizon on the hill and he sees this little deer, this, this little fawn, um, jumping out of a thicket and, and bounding down the hill and it's being pursued by, by two wolves or hounds, I can't remember. And, um, and, and this, this, this deer just, just runs down this hill as fast as it can. Um, the man sort of stands and watches this whole event going on. And eventually the deer sort of bursts through um, the sort of hedge of the garden, comes bounding towards the man with the two wolves in trail. And this deer just sort of comes up to the man and just sort of rams its head between his legs just right there. And so he sort of picks it up. And it's just sort of trembling and sort of holding on to him. And his two wolves approach and they, they, they go for the man and they're, and they're biting at his legs. They're scratching him, they're tearing away at him. 
but that man would not do anything, he would not let anything get to this little deer that has just come into his arms. He wouldn't give it over. That's something of an illustration of who Christ is with us, but it doesn't even work because it's not us who sought him out, it's him who sought us out. Greater love has no one than this than the man who lays down his life for his friends. And, and, and Jesus says here that it's by his own volition, his own accord. He didn't go to the cross unwillingly. He submitted to the will of the Father. He, he goes to this tree. He's nailed by his arms and his feet to pieces of wood by people that he creates. He submits himself to them, they spit on him, they mock him, they tear his clothes. He then takes upon the sin of all of his sheep. He, he takes it upon his own body, his own soul. It's put upon him and then he is crushed and stamped out and is torn to pieces under the wrath of his father. In our place, in the place of the sheep, the disobedient, wandering sheep, he bears their sin willingly and then rises from the dead three days later. My apologies there, I think the um, camera just ran out of date to just put that bit in again. Um, anyway, I was just saying, Christ willingly gave up his own life by his own choice, his own will, and then he rises from the dead for disobedient sheep like us. This is uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 25. It says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you are straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherds and overseer of your souls. It's Isaiah 40 verse 11. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the, la the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Friends, he has gathered up his lambs into his arms, his crucified arms. We are carried in, in those holes in his wrists as he lifts us up out of the muck and leads us to a new land, to new pastures, places of where we know more of him. He leads us into suffering, where we can know more of his suffering, know more of who he is. He leads us into, into delights so that we know of his pure delights and eventually he leads us on into the promised land where we can know him fully, love him fully, to know our shepherds. In verses 19 to 21, the people listening, the Jews, the Pharisees, they again don't understand. Some think that Jesus had a demon. But others say, no, this man healed the blind. He is th the real deal. And then why do some people believe and some not? Well, remember the illustration early on with, with the three shepherds. And, and they all went the different ways and called out their sheep and they followed. Only Christ's sheep will hear his voice and will follow. And perhaps you think, well, I don't know, am I one of his sheep? Am I one of the elect? And well, what I can say is, have you heard his voice? Have you heard the gospel and it's been unable to do anything but to respond, but to confess your sins. You've been compelled by God's word to believe the gospel. Have you heard that? Has that happened to you? If it has, Christ is your shepherd. And you're one of the sheep of his pasture. He's with you. And you know him and he knows you. The word of Jesus in, in verse 16, where he says that... Um, uh, there are other sheep not of this fold. He will go to them uh, and he will be one shepherd and, and, and one flock. That's happened here in the UK, uh, here in England, you know, thousands of miles away 
from the Middle East, from Israel, from where Jesus spoke those words. And yet, nevertheless, his word has come to us. And us English speaking people have heard his voice and have been saved. Now there's one flock, Jew and Gentile, one shepherd. We are all together in one flock. It's great mercy and love, isn't there, from our good shepherd. And just in closing thoughts, it's in line application. In response to this text and in response to the door and the shepherd. C.S. Lewis says that you have two options with Jesus. If you understand what he's saying, either you want to kill him for being a demon-possessed madman, a dangerous man. And that's what happened in, in, in the text. The Pharisees try and stone him, they try and kill him, but he, he escapes. You either do that or you worship. What did the uh, blind man do from chapter 9? What was his response? Verse 38 of chapter 9. Lord, I believe. It says that he worshipped him. Can I encourage you to do that? To worship him. And worship is so much more than just... Uh, the intellectual knowledge, it's more than just emotions, it's our, our whole body, our whole everything, body, soul and mind, all in unison, singing together the praise and the glory of our Creator. We must go on to, to new pastures of loving and knowing our God. We have to cultivate, to, to, to dig into our Bible, to to sow seeds, to let it grow into our hearts, the, the knowledge of, of our, of our Saviour. That is the abundant life. That's eternal life here, now, today, that we may have. Maybe those of you who are listening right now, um, maybe you've wandered away. Maybe you're like that one sheep who left the 99 and you've just wandered away, wandered away from the faith, it, it could be that um, you just you believed you were converted and you were sort of exploded with joy and you're chasing after your shepherds, but then you've lost your way. You are no longer feasting on his pure delights. You've started to let the wool around you grow a bit until you can't see straight anymore. The shepherd's voice calls you today, repent, turn around, come back to the shepherd and follow his voice. Don't abandon the church. The church is kind of like that, that flock, like that, that sheep fold. And outside of the wolves, the bears, there's danger. But inside the church, we're safe. And I know that right now, the current situation, we can't meet together as a church, but we can still be the church. You can still come to the live streams and, and all of that. Yeah, but you can phone up people. You can pray for people. We can still be a church together, even if we can't see each other face to face. Because outside of the church, there's danger, there's wolves, there's bears. We have to be together in this. And finally, the word shepherd is synonymous with pastor. Jesus appoints under shepherds for his flock, and they are a means of his own shepherding because... Pastors are supposed to shepherd through his word, aren't they? That they teach and preach through God's word, through Jesus' word. So they are a means of Jesus shepherding his own people. And uh, we are, as a church are in quite a strange time where we are without a pastor. We're without any elders. Um, Stephen and uh, Jim's time amongst us has come to an end as um, our pastor and, and elder. And so we as a church need to be collectively praying for a new pastor, for, for new elders, uh, and trusting that God would provide us uh, with that. And if maybe um, you're watching and you're a member of a different church, um, be very grateful and, and thankful for your serving elders and, and pastors uh, amongst you who are shepherding you with, um, with the word of, of the true shepherds. Well, I hope all these words have been uh, of encouragement to you. Uh, but uh, above all, I, I must ask you, have you heard the voice 
of your shepherds here today. Even though you're sitting at home perhaps and I'm here in my living room <laughs> with the cows. Have you heard the voice of Christ from his words here today? And if so, please just follow him, go to him, listen to him and grow in your knowledge of him. Go through the door, but don't just stick at the doorway, but follow the shepherds onto new pastures of, of, of knowing him. I'm just going to close us off with um, the last portion of Ezekiel 34. This is Ezekiel 34, verse 25. I will make with them a covenant of peace and banish wild beasts from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will send down the showers in their season. There shall be showers of blessing, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruits, and the earth shall yield its increase, and they shall be secure in their land, and they shall know that I am the Lord. When I break the bars of their yoke and deliver them from the hand of those who enslaved them, they shall no more be a prey to the nations, nor shall the beasts of the field devour them. They shall dwell securely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will provide for them renowned plantations, so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land, and no longer suffer the reproach of the nations. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord. And you are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the Lord God. Well, be blessed, saints. Thank you for coming along to our live stream. Uh, as I said at the start, so hopefully Stephen should have put a, um, a link for some songs to now go and listen to. As you listen, just uh, look out and, and listen for um, um, the shepherd popping up in those lyrics. Um, it should appear up here, perhaps, or down there somewhere. Just click on that if you can and, um, and listen to those, uh, those sets of, of worship songs. But thank you for joining us. And uh, please do now go in peace. And we really look forward in a few months' time to be able to meet together again. So um, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. In Jesus' name. Amen.